Now, more than any other exercise of democracy in this country, elections to the European Parliament are probably the ones which most perplex us. Who are these men and women asking for our support and what will they do if they get it? The electoral system is some weird method named after an obscure Belgian and how many people can even explain properly what the European Parliament does. But worry no more, our policy editor Chris Cook is tonight going to explain everything you wanted to know about Europe but we're afraid to ask. Well, not quite everything, but a start at least. First, who are we voting for and what do they cost us? The European Union is fantastically complicated. That's why we decided we would strip things down a little. We would lay it bare. We asked for your questions about the EU, and boy, did you send them in. We can deal with a lot of them by answering just one big question. What exactly is the European Parliament? That's a very good question. The European Parliament is officially the EU's most important institution. That's because it's directly elected. Now, it doesn't have the right to start new legislation. In that respect, it's less powerful than our Parliament in Westminster, for example. The European Parliament can only amend or block things that come through from the Commission. That's the EU's executive. Now, that means that it acts as a brake or an accelerator in what the EU does as a whole. So. Whether you want more Europe or less of it, the European Parliament really matters. And that means that this week's elections to pick Britain's 73 MEPs really matters too. So why don't we talk about it more? Part of the reason is you don't get the same intrigue that you get at Westminster with governments falling and forming. Who'd want to watch a House of Cards set in Strasbourg? Whatever happens, the European Parliament will just puff along, dealing with whatever legislation it gets sent. And it's just weird. It's multilingual. Some MEPs have ten times as many voters as other MEPs. And you know what else? It moves. Once every month, the whole Parliament gets on a train, leaves Brussels and goes to Strasbourg for about four days. And that shuttling backwards and forwards, that costs 200 million euros a year. The next question is, how much do MEPs actually get paid? That question came through a lot. And the short answer is €95,482 a year. But they also get some pretty good perks on top of that. For example, a very generous pension. And when they or the voters decide that it's time for them to stop being an MEP, they get quite a handsome payoff. So how much are those extra bits worth? Ha! Huh. Complicated. Well, to a man of 45 years old who's just been elected, the pension and the payoff are worth the equivalent of around €35,000 extra a year in cash. That would bring the total package up to about €130,000 a year, or just over £100,000. And of course, there are allowances. For every day that MEPs turn up at the Parliament, they get €304 Euros of subsistence allowances. It's a very comfortable life. Are you sitting comfortably? So here's a question that kept coming up. Don't accountants say that the EU is very wasteful? Well, sort of. In 2012, the EU spent around 139 billion euros. Of that, its accountant said 5% or so was spent in a way that made it error prone. That doesn't mean it was stolen, that doesn't mean it was wasted, just that the people who spent it didn't use quite the proper processes. So how much does it all actually cost? Well, in 2013, our subsidy EU came to about £14 billion. Of course, we do get stuff back for that, not least of which was about £5 billion in cash. I say cash, it's really more like a gift voucher. You have to spend it on certain stuff. Nonetheless, it brought down our net contribution to about £8.5 billion. Huh, is that a good deal? Well, if the UK economy were to be about 1% or so larger because of our membership of the EU and all the trade benefits that it brings, then it would probably pay for itself. So does it? A new study by the London School of Economics estimated that Britain has done very well out of its EU membership. They worked out that about 15% of our economy comes from selling stuff to Europe. 
They also estimated that in the best case scenario, if we were to leave, our economy would shrink by just over 2%. That's about a year of normal economic growth. One consequence of being an EU member, however, is that we have to follow a lot of EU rules. And some people believe that if we were freed from that obligation, we would be able to deregulate and then we'd be very competitive when it came to selling to the fast growing countries of East Asia and South America. But there's a wrinkle. If we were to really deregulate so that we could pursue those distant markets, it's more likely that we would be kicked out of a lot of markets in Europe. So trade with Asia would really have to skyrocket to make up for it. So that raises the question of just how much the EU's rules and regulations cost the UK. The European Union certainly regulates an enormous amount, but its real weight varies with your business. For example, if you're a graphic designer, it probably won't have very much effect. If you sell chemicals, it will have an enormous weight. So you often hear estimates for the proportion of British laws that come from Brussels or the cost of European regulation. But in truth, the effect of the European Union is very varied. It's really reshaping our society. It's helping some businesses and it's hurting others. Well now, Stephanie, we of all, the EU is all about open borders, freedom of trade and freedom of movement. The European Union was not sold to us as a way of bringing large numbers of foreigners uh, to this country to work and live without let or hindrance. But that is what has happened. Chris Cook again. Now onto your third block of questions. Ready for it? A number of pro-European viewers asked, why is it that we talk about Europe as though it's a thing that's done to us? After all, we have MEPs in the Parliament, we have ministers in the Council. Well, a large part of that sense comes down to one issue, European immigration, and the feeling that we never really had a vote about the extent of it. EU citizens can, of course, work in any EU country. And some people dislike the idea of not controlling our borders on principle. Others don't really mind. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. At the 2011 census, 2.7 million people in Britain were registered as having been born in another European country. But when people talk about European immigration, they don't generally mean French and German people. They're usually thinking people from further east. Since the fall of the Iron Curtain, the European Union has been spreading east. It now includes portions of the former USSR itself. These new EU members are much poorer than Britain. For example, a manufacturing worker in Poland can only expect to earn one quarter as much as their counterparts in Britain. That creates a pull, drawing people from Eastern Europe into the UK. There are around a million people now living in the UK who were born in the so-called A8 countries. Those are the nations that joined the EU in Eastern Europe in 2004. Of course, the currents that brought them to Britain also take East Europeans to other rich European nations. But back in the mid-2000s, Britain was one of only three countries that gave full access to the then new members of the EU. So we got a disproportionate share. Now, those are all very big numbers, but academics don't think there's any link between EU immigration and unemployment, nor with crime. And it's worth remembering that immigration isn't a one-way street. 1 1.8 million British people have gone to live elsewhere in the EU. So what effect does our EU membership have on all of these numbers? Well, of course, it increases them. But it's not easy to say by how much. Remember that Britain is a very open country. Two-thirds of our foreign-born population actually comes from outside Europe. So we shouldn't assume there wouldn't be immigration to Britain if we weren't EU members. Even so, it is the issue that most people associate with the European Union. And it's the explanation for why a lot of people feel there's a democratic deficit between them and Brussels. <laughs>